Hi, friend. Thanks for joining me. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. I think, um, yeah, I know I've enjoyed our friendship and uh, your threads for quite some time, and I think it will be illuminating to get into the story behind the man himself. So um, maybe just to start, we could dive into that, and I would love to hear you share your life story, whatever you'd like to say about your past and background, and uh, that you can answer that in whatever way you like, or whatever length. Okay, thanks. Um, well, uh, my real name is Gabe Broussard, or I should say my, my given name. And I was born in Southern California in Orange County. Um, I, was, I uh, grew up Catholic in a very um, trad calf fundamentalist family. Uh, we were part of a uh, religious community called the uh, People of Praise, which is the same religious community that Amy Coney Barrett, the Supreme Court Justice, comes from, um, although she's a little older than me and I didn't know her. Um, we moved um, up to the Northwest when I was 10 years old and um, stayed in religious communities. Um, and I was a part of that until I was a teenager and uh, rebelled hard and um, I had to go through a lot of tribulation with family and uh, and then eventually sort of uh, decided to uh, that I was uh, a militant atheist and that I was going to do that instead and um, it was sort of a follow along with that for a few years and uh, but really I, I was I was pretty adrift um, and struggling and and uh, um, I had a baby when I was 22 and realized that I, I did not have the skills that I needed uh, to uh, take care of that kid. Um, it was, it was, it, as I was holding her in my arms, I was, I became, I, the thought that, that occurred to me was I have no idea how to be a man. And so I thought I should go learn and I went and joined the Marines with the thought that they would do that. And also I think I intuited that I could um, recover some of the structure that I was missing from the cult-like communities I had been part of previously. Um, and that was, that was a true deduction, I think. And I spent seven more years in the Marines. Um, and then I got out when I was about 30. And um, it's kind of, hit the limit of that mode of meaning making and that mode of um, structuring my life. And a lot of things fell apart all at once. Um, so I uh, went searching for a therapist to help me out and eventually found this, this big six foot four utility kilt wearing Burning Man Ranger, who was also a therapist. And he helped me work through a developmental trauma that I was previously unaware of that was sort of like a, a gravity well in the, in the space of my mind, sort of sucking everything toward it. Um, and after I worked through that, um, I, I realized after I, so that took about two years. And, and after, I, after I got through that, I spent the next six months not in therapy, but thinking about it every day and thinking about the inner transformation and what had happened and the work that I had been doing. I'd been doing a, he had, he had sent me to a, a Zendo to sit and he had sent me to uh, martial arts, various martial arts studios to find the one that worked for me. Um, it really helped me sort of reorient and, and use the, the soldierly skills that I had in the service of my heart. So it sort of reorient me from a soldier toward a, a warrior, so to speak. Um, and I was, I felt obsessed with that transformation after I got out, I just wanted to know everything about how it happened and how to do it, how to do more of it. So I went back to him and I said, hey, I, I'm interested in, I think I want to seek enlightenment. Is that something you can help me with? And he was like, I don't know, but let's try. And so I spent the next five years working with him, um, doing free association, psychoanalysis, um, run through a cognitive behavioral lens. So I sort of learned about my internal symbolic order and how those thoughts informed the emotions and behaviors that were that sort of formed the complexes 
um, while at the same time I was really doing a lot of intense Zen meditation, a lot of martial arts work, and um, experimenting with lots of different um, spiritual practices and modes and those things um, to just to see what would happen. It was very much a see for yourself, go experiment, go find out what works, what doesn't, what happens when you contrast them, especially. Um, I worked with him up until um, around the middle of the pandemic when we parted ways. And that's about the time I got on Twitter. So um, then I found all, all of uh, this group of weirdos, uh, which I'm very grateful for. And um, I've been kind of uh, taking the reins myself and guiding my own journey from here. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for taking me through that. Um, definitely some points I'd love to dive into. And maybe just to start, uh, you know, in this lifetime, I've not been in the military, and I doubt that's in my karma for the rest of this lifetime. And so I'd be curious to hear uh, just what, what that time was like for you. And if you could sort of paint a picture of what being in the Marines was like for someone, you know, that doesn't know too much about that. Sure. Um, well, I spent four years active and I spent three years in the reserves. The reserves are, are, are pretty chill, you, you know. Um, um, the Marine Corps, what does it say about being in the Marine Corps? It's, it's extremely structured. It's down to the point of what you wear is determined to within a 16th of an inch. You have little tiny rulers and tools to make sure everything is perfect at all times. Um, it's, it's about um, total sort of self-annihilation in order to become this, to, to, to totally sort of like make your identity fully um, that the history, the tradition, the, um, the well, I guess the, customs and norms and the, and the ways of being in the world um, that come with the Marines. And all of those are intended to support your ability as the warfighter. Um, so everything is built up around um, combat skills and built up around uh, uh, being effective on a battlefield, being effective with a rifle. Uh, and so to that extent, something that's a little different about the Marines from other military services is that everyone in the Marine Corps is an infantryman first. So all of us uh, receive regular warfighter training and we don't, and then you go back to, you have your, you have your MOS, but that's always secondary to your combat training. Your MOS? So, I'm sorry, the military occupational specialty, which is mm -hmm. like, so I was an, I was an administrator. Um, I spent a lot of time. Uh, helping people with awards and arranging travel for colonels and things like this. Uh, but your, your primary job uh, is, is to train uh, for fighting every year. So what, what sort of strengths or virtues do you think you developed through that period of your life? Um, I discovered the limits of bodily endurance. Um, I, I did so in a state in which I was really alienated from myself. Um, and in a lot of ways, a lot of what I, what I did in the Marine Corps was done under a lot of dissociation and a lot of um, bad sort of bad habits for psychological black magic um, that, uh, uh, that took a long time to undo when I got out. Um, but I think some of the good things that I brought out of it was an, an extreme self-discipline when needed. Um, and I really, I know how far my body can be pushed. And I, I don't, my mind doesn't limit that anymore. Hmm. Well, do you think it would be possible to be enlisted in the military and be in active duty in a way that wasn't invoking sort of psychological black magic or bad habits or things like that? 
maybe in one of the other branches. <laughs> but the, uh, the Marine Corps very specifically uses cult-like techniques in boot camp um, mm -hmm. and then afterwards uh, to, to keep a kind of mental control, a control over the self-concept um, that I think can only really be maintained through pretty vicious self-coercion and, and dissociation. Hmm. Um, and I, I think it, o it only damages people over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I do think there is probably a healthy way to be a soldier, but I don't think, uh, I don't think it's in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. It has me just speculating perhaps idly what it might look like if you could help military services uh, structure things so that they weren't uh, systematically damaging people or something like that. And instead, like psychologically strengthening, if, if that was indeed possible, makes me curious about that. I, I think there there is a way, I mean, I think there, you can you can reach extraordinary psychological strength in the Marine Corps um, in terms of having an identity that is blended with a communal organization or or an like an ideological construct. Um, you can you can, um, I mean, people sacrifice their lives for their for their fellows and and for their country, and that's that takes extraordinary psychological strength to do that. Um, but I, I would say that um, that the strength that I would say that the, the strength, the spiritual strength that we would think of as um, feeling bound up in something that was much higher than ideology or nation, um, I think uh, is a strength of heart that isn't possible in ideological constructs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it's a it's a strength of, of true nature that isn't available to someone who who has to be embedded in ideology to have the, the strength of self yes yes and even if you could it seems like it would be hard to scale that it's hard to yeah that. yeah uh, you can systematize it's... a military but you can't systematize what you're talking about, I think. Is it individuation? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I if somebody could systematize individuation, we'd, we'd all be free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you talking about that. Uh, it's just, it feels uh, precious to get into a glimpse into a kind of life that, uh, yeah, that I've not had and don't know about, but is, you know, uh, I think it's, worthy of respect to, to know about that way of life. And I appreciate you sharing it. Uh, Thank you. I'd be curious to hear more as well about uh, how you would describe the developmental trauma that you said that you worked through when you first worked with uh, this mentor that you had. Sure. Um, so my, my, I mean, an important piece of context for this is that my father um, is a, is paranoid schizophrenic. Mm. Uh, and so, um, the the abstractions that haunted him ruled over our household mm. uh and uh, disobedience was not not just seen as um uh you know uh like a bother for the parents or trouble for the family it was seen as as like an existential threat to the spiritual defense of the family mm. uh so uh when I was rebelling and I was you know, experimenting with pot and I was playing Dungeons and Dragons, doing things that good Christian boys shouldn't do, uh, I, there was—I I mean, I—I I, was in—I was in trouble often. I was a difficult kid, of course. I had difficult parents. We were—it was a difficult arrangement. Uh, I was in trouble uh, pretty regularly, and um, I think the final straw was that I, I had installed the game Diablo 2 on my parents' computer. Mm -hmm. And my dad sort of like opened the computer to see these like spinning pentagrams, like <laughs> not recognizing that the game was some like stupid metal head, uh, you know, you're going and killing the devil type of thing. He thought I, you know, 
was bringing demons into the house and he was, you know, and so, so it, so he, um, it sort of treated me as though I were demonically possessed and, and gathered up all my things and threw me out of the house onto the streets. And, um, and I lived out there until, um, uh, well, I guess a couple of weeks until I couldn't anymore. And I was forced to go back home and, uh, and, and pretend that I, that I was actually the one that was wrong and that I was the one that, uh, you know, deserved the punishment and had to take it. Uh, and this actually happened uh, a few more times. And sort of um, what I would come to understand later was that it, it really shattered my ability to trust uh, a developmental environment um, and not, um, uh, and not be as pathologically self-conscious all the time. And I just kind of be terrified of I don't know what what's what the thing is gonna be that's gonna that's gonna get me kicked out or that's gonna get me that's that's gonna find me totally vulnerable to the world without any support or defense. Uh, and I lived in that orientation, you know, from the age of I guess I was 16 when that happened. Um, until until I was able to heal it when I was 32 or 33. What did the healing process involve for that? Exposure therapy. Tell me about that. What's that? So exposure therapy is the gold standard for treating anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, it's a process by which uh, a person confronts their fears uh, a little at a time and purposefully induces panic states within themselves. And then rather than allowing the activation of the nervous system to uh, guide their actions, you, you choose instead to activate your parasympathetic nervous system and dispel that energy. So the there are five primary ways that you can activate your parasympathetic nervous system when you are panicked. And that's fight, flight, freeze, eating, or having sex. Or you can call those the five Fs, which is the joke, which is fight, flight, feed, freeze, fuck. So when you purposefully induce a panic state by exposing yourself to the things that terrify you and then get control of them, uh, using the five F's in my case, uh, I just did a half an hour of them of each one every day in a way that made me feel calm. And I sort of, I structured them as, as spiritual practices, each of them as spiritual practices. Um, and so, and obviously that takes a long time. That's three hours every day of, of therapy. Um, but over time you really, uh, build a nervous system that's pretty, um, resilient. Hmm. And so there was a lot of that. There was a lot of confession and a lot of, um, working through toxic shame. And, um, and there was a lot of, uh, uh, disentangling myself from my family and disentangling myself from codependent patterns, um, that, you know, existed in my family that I grew up with. And, uh, and I think that works ongoing always, um, What did, can you sort of paint me a picture of what you exposing yourself to these triggers and then working through them with the five F's look, might've looked like on a given day? Sure. So, well, so at first I, I did not, I didn't have a great um, theory of my, of my own emotions or great awareness of my own emotional states, you know? So I kind of had to figure that out first. Like what do all these feelings mean? And then once I had that, I was, and, and, and was working on uh, mindfulness and working on uh, metacognition skills. I was able to sort of watch what thoughts would precipitate emotional states hmm. and then connect and then, and then journal into those thoughts. Well, where does that come from? What's, what's in the, what's the, where, where do those roots go in my unconscious? And when I could find sort of all the associations, 
uh, of, of what this thing was that terrified me, then it's, it's a, actually a relatively simple thing to, um, to find manifestations of that on the internet hmm. and go expose yourself. And then, and then half an hour, each of the five F's soon, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't actually take too long, but it's, but it's extraordinarily unpleasant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, wow. huh. What, um, there's sort of an, like, I, I can imagine someone objecting and being like, that seems like it wouldn't help. Why, why would that be something that would help? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I, uh, a little bit. There's a persistent myth that this is something that could be harmful and that this is something that um, uh, you know, would, is not helpful to people. And we have a mountain of evidence that says the opposite. Hmm. There, there is something to be said if someone has very severe or complex PTSD. And I, and I mean, uh, re like really severe cases uh, wherein an exposure to a trigger actually can destabilize um, their life or destabilize their, their mental state, then you wouldn't, want, um, you wouldn't want to expose someone to large amounts of their triggers uh, you know, against their against their will, or you wouldn't, you know, I mean, certainly all, there's always informed consent with exposure therapy, but you would want to be careful about, uh, you know, um, not introducing those people to triggers to whatever responsibility you could take for that. But that's, that's a relatively rare thing. And what it is, is it's painful. It is emotionally painful to, to face the things that cause you strong emotions. Um, and, uh, and so there is, so there's this kind of like folk wisdom that sprung up that, um, that avoiding your fear or that avoiding triggers or avoiding these sorts of things um, is a healthy or a good thing. And it's, it's not. And in fact, the longer you let an anxiety go unconfronted, it festers and worsens and, and implants itself even deeper in, in the mind. And it's so much harder to get out. Mm. Um, and so none, none of that is to, is, is to say uh, that, uh, you know, when we do things like, like put trigger warnings on, on media or in, in schools, that this isn't done compassionately and, and with good intentions. And um, in my mind, it's a, it's a compromise that, um, that everybody, that probably everybody doesn't like, but it's good enough. Because um, there are a few people that it's, it would, you know, it, it would not be good for them, or it's not necessary for them to confront certain kinds of content on, on some days. Um, but by and large, uh, creating an environment in which people can avoid feeling their fear is, is really quite uh, detrimental to their health. Hmm. Hmm. What did you see start to happen for you as you practiced exposing yourself to your fears and doing the five Fs? Like what kinds of shifts happened for you? Uh, This is such a difficult part to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, you're, um, I mean, you're polishing the mirror. So, uh, so you become truer. Um, I would say the, if you think of the, self or the personality as the space of meaning making and the, the, the process of relating to truth, then with every anxiety that you face and overcome, you have a greater capability to relate to the truth and you have a um, greater capacity for the truth. Um, and, and truth compels when you know something is true, you don't have to work at it anymore. You don't have, there's nothing you have to do to convince yourself of it. It's like once, once an, a falsity has been exposed, it just, why would you persist in it? It's ridiculous. Um, and so sort of confronting truth uh, and confronting 
and building the capacity for truth uh, causes all kinds of transformations. Um, they're, they're really difficult to put into words because so many of them are experiential. Um, but, but, all, but really a lot of, um, you just start to change. You just start to, you just start to uh, look around and go, oh, wow, like, wow, there was, there was like, I learned a proverb about that when I was four years old and that was true the entire time. And I just like somehow got away from that. And I, and, and there's all, and my life is actually filled with all of this simple bounty and joy and, and goodness. And it's, and I've, and I've been, I've been standing waist deep in water, dying of thirst. I realize the shifts are sort of hard to talk about. Could you talk about um, maybe something that you used to be afraid of or were afraid of and like what you exposed yourself to? And uh, maybe that would help us get a little deeper into your experience of it. Sure. Do you mind if I pour myself a little more tea here? Please. Thank you. Um, well, maybe most directly, uh, one of the things that I, I really struggled with um, was a really a very complicated uh, uh, psychological problem that I had was that I, I compulsively avoided telling the truth, hmm. which isn't which isn't to say that I compulsively lied, but I was extremely creative hmm. about about shaping people's interpretations of things. And this had to do partially with the, the kind of cultish background. And it also had to do with growing up queer in that background and needing to lie to myself and to my family for um, safety. Um, uh, and when, when you need to lie to yourself in order to uh, feel like you've got Base, like basic safety in your home, you, you screw up your relationship to the truth pretty bad. Mm. Um, and it came to a point where I was pretty, pretty compulsively trying to present an image that would keep things good at all times, keep attention off of me and keep attention away from me and um, make sure nobody was, nobody could, could see any outlines of a closet. I could see any outlines of any, any of this. Um, and, uh, and so I had a real, uh, I mean, I had a real deep fear of just being myself, but I had a really deep fear of my sexuality. Um, and I had very deep shame over the way that I allowed it or allowed it to manifest the way that it manifested because it was going to, um, you know, I, I was very ashamed of, of the attraction that I felt toward men. And I was very ashamed of the way that, um, that would manifest in my life by sort of like shady hookups and um, the ways I was endangering myself, you know, by, by doing those and, and having sex with strangers. And, um, you know, uh, and I, I was really afraid of talking about that with anyone. I was afraid of facing that in any, in any sense of the, of the word. And I was, and I was deeply afraid that if I, that if I admitted that, that I was going to somehow stop loving women and, and not wanting women in my life and that I was going to be gay. And I was, and there was this part of me that was like, but I don't like, I don't want to stop loving women. So I'm not going to face this part of me because that's what that means. Um, there wasn't really, there weren't exactly any like bisexual role models, you know? Uh, so I wasn't really aware of this being like a possible space mm -hmm. that you could exist in. Uh, and so I sort of had to crawl inch by tortured inch out of the closet, uh, you know, working with a therapist and, and, and I had to learn all kinds of skills and undo and face all kinds of shameful lies and, and prevarications and manipulations and things that I've been doing my entire life, um, in order to avoid anyone finding this thing out about me or, uh, hmm. Hmm. yeah, what, maybe what that's, what did you do to expose yourself to that? Like, what was the act of exposing yourself to those inner lies? 
Um, that happened pretty naturally, mm -hmm. but that was more a process of, of getting called out over and over and over again mm. by my therapist, but in a safe way. Mm. And then it, sort of the more that I was able to say, yeah, I lied about that. I see how it harms me. I'm not going to do that anymore. Then I would be able to go home and journal into that and then start to expose myself to the ways I, to memories mm -hmm. that I that previously would have been intolerable and that I would have suppressed um, or just unconsciously defended against in some way. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't even have come into consciousness. Um, and I was able to sort of face them and see the way that they went wrong um, and, and derive the lesson and if necessary, write down the lesson um, and then be able to bring, and then be able to bring that back to my guy and be like, um, here's this thing, here's what I learned. And, and here's, here's how it's still affecting my life. Here's the ways that I'm still engaging in this behavior and, um, and the ways it's still fucking me over and I'm going to stop. And a, and a lot of times it would take There's never easy direct one-to-one -one correlations between these things, but eventually you find, you pull on enough of the threads that a piece of the Gordian knot loosens up and then you get a, and then you get a big pull and it loosens everything up and you can start to work with stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it looks sort of like journaling with specific memories from your past. Yeah, journaling was really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you tell someone who's maybe interested in this uh, practice about getting started with it? I, uh, if it was exposure practice, mm -hmm. I would say, try to structure it yourself first. So, um, start with something you're afraid of, but not too afraid of. Mm. Uh, expose yourself to a little bit of it until you start to feel a little spooked, like you don't wanna look at it anymore. And then have some running shoes nearby or some boxing gloves nearby and a punching bag or whatever it takes. Um, and go uh, dispel that energy and then see how it, it feels. There, there isn't a, a, an immediate satisfaction that comes from it. It's something that, that happens slowly over time when you start to realize as you go back to re-expose yourself that it's just not working. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can structure it yourself and you can keep it in, in control um, and not send yourself into states of real panic that are destabilizing, then I say you can do it, you can do it yourself. Um, but a lot of times, but yeah, yeah. If, if you cannot do that and a lot of people can't, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, then it helps to have a professional who can help structure it for you and keep you accountable and have someone to answer questions and sort of the, the scary or unknown parts of doing this, but there's no, it's not a, um, it's not an inherently extremely risky thing that requires a professional to face your fears mm -hmm. you know it's just uh if you let your let your internal signals guide you and be willing to push yourself just a bit um a lot of people can do it on their own mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. and can you do you need to do all of the five f's like you did or is it could you do one of them or anything that activates the parasympathetic nervous system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. it doesn't need to be all five Mm -hmm. Um, there, some, some fears, some bundles of nerves will only calm down via certain things that you do. And, and there are strange, um, and kind of beautiful egoic resonances sometimes between the things that will work and that won't work. You'll mm -hmm. be scared of some things that you can, that you can punch down until you're bigger than them. And you'll be scared of some things that you can only run away from, mm -hmm. uh, to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And, and that's just. That's just how it is. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Is that why you tried to do all five every day for a while? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just Wasn't to make taking sure any you chances. Everything. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm sort of imagining, um, as you said that, that like, for example, um, I don't know, I, like I, maybe I'm afraid of expressing my anger or there's anger that I have at someone and that that might not resolve until like I was punching and fighting. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Sometimes, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I, think so, I think the way in which you're wounded and the way in which various forms that the five Fs can take are often linked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If someone makes you feel very, if someone has made me feel very small, then using a punching bag to get that energy out helps a lot because that helps me to feel like I'm equalizing the size. Mm. Mm. Um, if yeah, I think that's the right. Some, sometimes the only thing that's going to work is sexualizing the anxiety. Mm. And so it turns, you turn it into a kink or, and you make it a tantric practice and you, mm. you get it out that way. Um, sometimes the only thing that works is freezing in place. So you sit Zazen while you're panicking and you just hold it and you just sit with the panic and feel the fullness of it until it dies down. Sometimes it doesn't die down and you just sit for 30 minutes with panic and that's garbage. So I try to always, I always try to always sit at the end of my five S <laughs> just in case. <laughs> but if that's the last thing that'll do it, then, uh, then you'll get there eventually. But I would just way rather be, be punching and running and, and eating and doing all the other stuff first, you know? Wow. Well, I feel like that answers so much for me right there. What you just said about, um, why, uh, both why traditions would want you to sit still and why that would be unbearable sometimes i i hate sitting still and i've done i've done many 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 hours of it uh which is part of why i hate it and so the idea of uh it's like oh yeah do that last and the idea of you know fighting or running sounds great uh so um yeah i'm interested in 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 this hearing you talk about it so appreciate you sharing it yeah um, thanks for asking about it I'd love to ask as well about this uh, technique that uh, you've shared before about the ideal apology. And um, can you tell me what prompted that experience of developing that technique and what that has been like for you? Sure. Um, so I, uh, um, I, I, I sort of developed or maybe stumbled upon I think this kind of this kind of imaginal technique. Um, when uh, so I, I had so prior to the pandemic in the year prior to um, the pandemic 2019, um, and then into 2020, was that right? Is that the right timeline? It was about a year and a half. Um, I was I was in an, an abusive relationship that became increasingly so when the pandemic began. Um, and it, uh, it, it was bad enough that it induced uh, some post-traumatic stress disorder and some emotional damage uh, when I got out. So, um, so I once again used exposure therapy to heal the cognitive damage. Um, but then for, for six months afterwards, the emotional damage remained where I was still, I was just consumed with a desire for vengeance. I was so angry. Um, and I thought about it all the time and I, and I had a really hard time not thinking about it. And I, I had gotten my executive function back and I had gotten the, the, the quality of thought back such that I could um, start to engage with my life again, but the emotional pain would kind of constantly pull me out of the present. And, um, and I knew what I, what I needed was some kind of resolution, some kind of um, catharsis, some kind. Um, but that was not, that's not possible. It's often not possible, you know, in the aftermath of an abusive relationship. You, even if you could get back in, in contact, you probably shouldn't in a lot of cases, um, you know, sort of depending on circumstances. So, um, so I was, I was sort of, um, 
I was working with this and I tried just about just about everything I could think of to work with these feelings. And there was no amount of punch and fighting or running or anything that was that was giving me lasting relief from the from the pain. Um, and and then I was reading a I was reading, you know, Twitter like you do. And and I was reading uh, some of this work that River Wilderlist was doing uh, about imaginal techniques and then chow chu was um posting a lot at the time about ifs um and sort of ideal parenting imaginal techniques and it just sort of i was at work one day and it just sort of struck me like if i stably imagine my ex-partner apologizing to me would that give me a little relief mm -hmm. and so i so i i imagined us meeting in a safe place which is like a, a bench at the Mount Tabor Park right by my house. And um, I imagined her sitting across from me and, uh, and, and telling her everything she'd done and all of the damage that had, that had happened, all the pain I'd gone through and her, and then I imagine her hearing it and accepting it and sincerely apologizing for it. And I, and I instantly felt some of the charge drain out of me. Uh, and that, that took about a half an hour and I was, was pretty amazed by it so i said okay um and i did it again for the next few days it was kind of a half an hour each time and more more and more of the charge kept draining every time i did it and i i would try to do more than a half an hour and it didn't it didn't it was kind of like i could go through the scene sort of two or three times and then that would be about it mm -hmm. um but what started to happen was the more the more i did it and the more of the of the anger that i was able to get out of the way the more the scene started to be able to expand. So I was able to see more of the fantasy, more of what my heart really desired would happen. Hmm. And the end of this, uh, the end of this fantasy, the, the, the denouement of this story uh, was that I was able to start forgiving her and I was able to start uh, practicing that and and not not just in in imagination but physically saying it and physically starting to let go and let go in a meaningful way um and then after i was able to do that a few times it expanded even more and i was able to apologize for my part mm -hmm. and I, I i was not i i did not abuse her um but of course i was not perfect and of course i made mistakes and i didn't said and did hurtful things that I wish that I hadn't and, um, and getting the opportunity not just not just to be in you know in a grieved victim and and get my apology but to really arrive at an, at an imagined space where the whole thing was clear and and the debts could be canceled um you know not not paid because they'll they, they never will be but just not collected on Mm -hmm. um, I, I sort of I needed that space, whether it was uh, in in reality or or in imagination. And I, I think, you know, it's a poor substitute ultimately for the real thing. Um, but um, but it is a substitute. It does work, mm -hmm. and it gave me a lot of relief and it helped me heal a lot. Um, it's still something that, that causes pain from time to time. It's still something that needs to heal. Um, but I think that's, I think time will do it. Time will do the rest now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm not sure I could have, I, 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 it may be in a, in a way the, this, a, this imagined, this ideal apology was sort of sutured the wound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What? What sense do you make of like the five F's not working to resolve that and then this technique working to help you heal that? I don't know. It doesn't, anger isn't always Mm -hmm. 
not all anger is the same. Um, anger that's that's coming from a place of fear. Um, that's coming from a from a place that in, within yourself that that sort of can be refined, can be disciplined. Um, coming from places of spiritual weakness or from places times you've been you were overwhelmed when it when it wasn't your fault and you're carrying those patterns into the future. Um, that anger a lot of times can be can be worked with at, as fear, as as the fear that underlies it. I think some anger is warranted. Some anger is 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 justified. Um, it's okay to be angry at someone who hurt you. It's okay to be angry at someone who robbed a year of your life um, to mental injury. Um, and I don't think we should try to therapize that away. I don't think that we, I don't think that if when someone has righteously been aggrieved that we should try to find some behaviorist technique that, uh, that helps them feel happy somehow. That's not, uh, uh, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And part of, part of what I'm sort of inferring or adding as well as that, like, in this case and similar cases, it's sort of a relational thing and uh, the resolution is relational as well. Of like, it's not just like in your nervous system, it like has to do with a very specific person that you had a very specific situation with. And so even though you couldn't actually have a conversation with your abusive ex, like imagining that would sort of address it relationally with the specific person. Uh, does, that, does that sound accurate? Yeah, that sounds, yeah, that sounds spot on. Yeah, I would say it's it's still in the nervous system, mm -hmm. um, but that you're not gonna you're not gonna get in there via your relationship to yourself, which is what mm -hmm. exposure therapy works on. It's yeah, it, it, it would have to be. And yeah, that sounds great. Sounds mm -hmm. just right. Mm -hmm. Do you think, like I, I, I'm assuming that you still are not able to or not willing to speak to your abusive ex, but like if it turned out that that was logistically possible, she was willing and it was safe for you, would you still want to have the same kind of conversations in reality? I would um, not. Can you say more about that? The price I've paid to get to where I'm at, mm -hmm. the work that I've that I've done to get healthy. Um, is now an important part of my self construction. Mm. Uh, I don't think there would be anything I would get out of it. And I don't trust that she was she was a she was a manipulator and she mm -hmm. psychologically abused me. And I, I would not trust that. I would not trust that it would be a, a, a safe situation. Yeah. I know you said in the hypothetical, like hypothetically it was safe. It's hard mm -hmm. to conceive of, of how, <laughs> how it could be. Yeah. It's like, like psychologically, like, of course, yeah. physically it, it's not unsafe and, and um, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I, yeah, it's hard to conceive of it. I just, I, I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um if there was a if there was a, a a button i could press or a letter i could write or a an action i could take that would that would give her closure i would do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And i would and hope she would i would hope she would do the same for me but i wouldn't read a letter from her either uh-huh uh-huh yes that makes sense that makes sense but part of the reason i'm asking is, is less about the specific relationship which which yeah it makes complete sense they'd be like 
yeah, I'm not, I'm not uh, trusting this, even this hypothetical safety makes complete sense. Uh, and I'm just sort of chewing on what you said about the exercise being a poor substitute, but a substitute nonetheless, and kind of curious about, uh, I imagine that the remainder of like, what makes it a substitute is sort of it actually being a real person that you talk to. And I've, I've felt the same similar flavor when I've done these, uh, like I've done a lot of the um, ideal parent or ideal self or ideal partner ones. And those always feel, there's this flavor of like, ah, this is helpful and satisfying. And it feels like half of an itch being scratched or something like that. And, uh, you know, it, it, it always makes me wonder about what it takes to, to sort of scratch the other half of the itch. And I think um, some of that healing for me at least seems to I either 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 I haven't developed sufficient skill in those techniques to be able to like scratch my own itch, which is very plausible, or um, some of it needs to happen relationally in addition to imaginally. And um, those both seem plausible to me. I'm not sure, but yeah, yeah, yeah we're we're dialogic creatures, so not surprise me at all. And 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 even as we're talking, you know, I'm feeling this there's a desire that's coming up in my heart that like, oh, maybe, maybe there would be some day could come along that like, you know, she was healed enough and able to sort of like come, come to the, you know, come to the truth about it and, and I really want to resolve that. But I, unfortunately, like there's, I have a, I have a personal principle that I derived directly from this experience, several of them, but this one in particular is, is where, where trust is present, uh, not being vulnerable is madness. Mm. And where, where trust is impossible, being vulnerable is madness. Mm. And it's just, there'd just be no way for me ever to uh, level with her mm -hmm. uh, it, as much as I would love to, as much as I would love to have that conversation and, yeah. and be able to sort of release that, you know, in, in finality. Right, right. I have I have the suspicion that some of the things that you've said are things that I could basically that I could use to hurt myself in the future. So I want to make sure I understand you clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, I'm wondering about how two things fit together that I've heard from you. One is um, I um, how to put this. You said earlier when you're talking about exposure therapy that like, you know, it's good to expose yourself to the things you're afraid of and that the longer that you sort of avoid the things that you're afraid of, the more, you know, insidious and harmful they become. And I'm like, yeah, that I'm, I'm thinking of specific things that I do that I've sort of like put at arm's length because I'm scared of them and they're difficult for me. Um, and it's like, yeah, I feel inspired to maybe dive into them and, and try and, you know, dip my toe in the water. and what I just saw you do and say is a very, I, I, if I heard you correctly, it was a very reasonable, like something like I, it, it is not safe for me to talk to that person. It will hurt me if I talk to her. Um, I don't trust her. She manipulated me. It would be unsafe for me, which seems like eminently reasonable, you know? Uh, and I think, um, um, how to put this it's, it's a little, it's a little hard for me to put those two things next to each other. Like, how do you know if you're, avoiding feeling fear that you're just promulgating in your nervous system versus uh you know you have a really healthy boundary and you're like this is just not actually safe for me to interact with this person or you know be engaging in this way what's what's the difference there the question is whether you're subject to the fear or whether you can hold the fear as an object and work with it hmm. so if if the fear is driving compulsive behavior that you are not choosing, then you're still subject to it. And some in my in my practice, in my view of uh, life and what we're doing here, you got to work with that. You've got to face that. You can't let it run. You can't let it run you. You can't let it control you. Just because you gain power over fear doesn't mean you no longer have it or that you no longer feel it. It just means that you get to choose. And a lot of times fears are very rational and healthy. And then that fear is an advisor and says, don't do this. 
it doesn't move your legs for you. You move your legs. And what's what's the difference between that and I'm I'm still not quite sure how that fits with like no I'm going to have a boundary with this person that hurt me it's not safe for me is that like I mean maybe I was hearing something like if with the exposure therapy you're like choosing when and how you are exposed to these things and you have control over it and it's like at your own pace versus you know if it's with a specific person that could hurt you then you don't have control over it and they could actually hurt you in a way that's not good for you is that sort of the difference or is there something else there I don't think that all, I don't think that fear is bad or evil or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's information. Um, maybe I'm not understanding. I think that, I think it's information. And if you can conceive of yourself as the person receiving this information, who makes the decision of what to do, and how to best protect yourself, mm -hmm. then, um, then that fear is appearing in, in consciousness as something outside yourself and it is not substituting judgment for yours. It's not, you're not embedded in it such that it's invisible and, and, and part of being, um, or sort of the invisible water that you're sweating in, so to speak. I would not say uh, that somebody who was afraid of bears uh, and overcame their fear of bears with exposure therapy uh, was like still embedded in their fear if they didn't want to go around a live one uh, with no safety protections and with no, I mean, like any human being should not do that. That's stupid. But if someone like, you know, um, can't, has real mental problems, uh, you know, be, from seeing a bear on television, which this is, real, is a real thing, this happens to people. And then mm -hmm. they need to go expose themselves, uh, you know, to pictures of bears and, and, and I feel, you know, I feel like I'm torturing a metaphor here, but mm -hmm. um, there's, there's such a thing as getting control over your fear. Am, am, I, am I missing what you're asking? No, that's, that's, that's getting to it. Um, that's helpful, that's a good example, and I wonder, if we can say simply and generally what the principle is that distinguishes like a healthy boundary that protects your real safety and something that's, uh, um, you know, uh, indulging a fear, basically. Yeah, ir irrational, maybe. Um, Trying to think if there's one generalizable principle you can use. I'm not sure. I'm not sure there is. I would think of this as something akin to reality testing. Hmm. Where you would be when you when you have a fear come up and you really let the fear fully play out. So not just I see the object of which I, uh, or the object that of which I'm afraid, and then I have my fear response and I and I go really sitting with it and being like, where does this go? What does this threaten? How does it happen? Um, letting the mind play the whole story out and watching it, and then if you can rationally assess the risk of that happening, and it's and it's. Uh, Well, if you, if, you, if you are not irrationally avoiding it in a case where it's extremely unlikely, right? Or if, or if you are not um, impulsively uh, overriding it in a case where it's too likely, you know, if, you're, if you're behaving in a way that's, that's um, consonant with the, the, act, the real risk, um, the real consequences, the real probabilities, um, then I would say that you are in control of that fear. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's well said. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. Part of what I'm thinking about is um, that I'm digesting in the background is uh, there's a situation that's been painful to me for some time and uh, there's a lot of terms that are associated with that in my mind that I've had muted on Twitter for quite a while and then uh, a number of accounts that are associated with that pain for me where I've muted these people and uh, and so as I hear you speaking about the exposure therapy I'm thinking like oh is that helping me or is it exacerbating those fears and challenges for me uh, and I don't know we'll see how this conversation settles with me but Part of what I'm thinking right now in this moment is um, uh, that that was helpful for a time and may even still be helpful for more of a time, but then at some point it will be good to, yeah, expose myself to the things that trigger me and not, not just on Twitter, but uh, elsewhere. It seems, yeah, basically like a conscious cope for a time. It's like, yes, this is a cope and like what was needed for a time. And at some point it will be time to pay dues on that cope. The bill always comes due, mm -hmm. but this, that doesn't mean it's not worth it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and like you said, there are different kinds of anxieties. You know, there are different kinds of, um, not every emotional reaction that you have is rooted in, a, a, you know, a deep-seated uh, terror, you know? Uh, sometimes emotions can be overwhelming that aren't, that aren't rooted in some fundamental sort of like uh, misfiring of the sympathetic nervous system. And you know, that's not, you know, going and exposing yourself to that over and over again would just be self torture. It would just mm -hmm. be. Yeah, that's, that, I think when you mentioned that, that's making me realize as well that in this situation, part of what's difficult is that the triggers are largely online. And so I don't know if I um, was, uh, you know, uh, encountering them in real life, there'd be some kind of um, control that I'd have over them or like, you know, I could like leave a room, for example, or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. take space or something. But because I don't know, I, I sort of I'm very online. And so it's like, if, if there's just a flood of these things coming all the time, it's like, not uh, th there's something like di the digital environment allows your, you to be triggered just much, much more of the time at, at rate depending on what the thing is, of course, but um, in this case, it's felt, it's felt like extremely artificial where it's like, oh, there's this situation that would be much easier to work with if it was primarily just physical, but because of the internet, it's like much harder than it might otherwise be, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I am. I, I would say to that, that mo most of the exposure therapy I do is, is internet based mm -hmm. in the sense of the exposure that mm -hmm. I go seeking out. It's just, is the the uh, the internet is an absolute wonderland of triggers <laughs> to go explore and play in? As everyone knows, it's a yes. you know an outrage machine if you let it be. Yes. Um, and but when I do it, I have I have a, 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 a I have a martial arts gym in my basement, and I have my running shoes are right there, and I've got everything's all set up. And if you don't have that, um ready to go and you don't have a lot of experience already already doing exposure practice then i i would not say uh it's a good idea to jump into the deep end all at once you know mm -hmm. i think it's a much better idea to, uh, to uh to start small and get the gear you need and get the space that you need and uh, and do it that way or, yeah. or 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 build the routines or the space that's, that will help you get it but it doesn't um it's pretty hard to go from zero to uh, uh proficient with it uh, without having somebody there to help with the program yes that seems that seems true of whether you have an existing setup and like even awareness of this framework as well but also i think there's a difference between um intentionally using the internet to expose yourself using a structure like that and the internet unintentionally triggering you through whatever happens to be coming through your feeds or things like yeah, that. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. Um, in this case, uh, 
yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff can be triggering. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, uh, For what it's worth, uh, I'm sorry you're going through that. And if I can you. help in any way, I'm here for it. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, this you're, you're already helping. This feels like it will be a uh, a useful way to look at that that experience. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, so I I wonder if. Um, You could speak to um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is about your uh, nightly tweet, which is the thing that you tweet every night. Now, now comes with a beautiful piece of art, which I quite like. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll just read it because it's such a beautiful sentence. Uh, you are not inferior to anyone. Good night. I love you. See you in the morning. It's a tweet to myself. Uh, you said, this is the origin of my nightly tweet is what I'm reading from. There's a thread where you wrote about this relationship. And I wondered if you could speak about how you wrote that sentence and, and how it helped you heal from that difficult period of your life. Sure. Yeah. So um, I guess uh, another, another piece of what helped me recover from um, from the aftermath of that relationship was, uh, was, was learning to, to do daily affirmations, which is the cheesiest thing. And it feels so embarrassing when you do it, but it, but it works. Uh, I was, I needed to repair some, some trust in myself. Um, I, I needed to repair trust that I would protect myself and that I would not allow myself, um, to be put into a situation where I could be subjugated like that again. Mm. Uh, and so I, um, so I started saying these mantras and I have, I have a, a few of them and they're pinned up on my mirror downstairs and I go look in the mirror and I say these things to myself and it's their, their pledges of, of unconditional love and protection and, um, and then, uh, you know, when I first started doing that, there were, um, there were a lot of feelings that would come up like, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Or like, how are you going to do that? Or, you know, and then I would have to dig in, you know, and then I would dig into those and be like, okay, what's, what's that fear? What is, what is the way I'm not protecting myself or what is the way that I'm not, you know, where do I not have the knowledge I need to prevent this from happening again? Like where, mm -hmm. where do I not understand these things well enough? And then you go get the books and you go, you make, you make the promises to yourself. You keep the promises no matter what. Um, and soon, and soon that, that piece of you, that part of you that is doubting sees the effort. And even though it's, it goes, I'm still not sure you can do it, but I see you trying. Mm -hmm. and, and then it, it joins back up with the rest of the game. Um, this mantra was partially inspired by the affirmation work, because one of the things about, one of the things about abuse, no matter who, who you are or from whom it's coming is, is that it, it just works on the parts of the brain that are intensely focused on situating yourself within power structures and uh i wanted to remind myself every night that um that i'm not inferior to anyone and that and that i'm not superior to anyone there's not even a there's no uh it's a philosophically empty idea there's no in in toto axis or or um, dimension on which one human could ever be superior to another. We're all, we're so uh, multitudinous <laughs> that someone's always ahead of you somewhere. Someone's always behind you somewhere. You can't get any useful information at a, in a global context about who's better than who you can. It's really only useful in very local and particular contexts. Um, you know, I could say Tashin has a superior skill in meditation to me. And that doesn't say anything about my overall quality as a human being or your overall quality as a human being. 
that doesn't say Tashin is superior to me, right? Um, so it's it that was my way of sort of like bre breaking apart, showing the emptiness of the feeling of inferiority. Um, and another thing that that informed this is that looking back on my life, and and certainly in this this most recent relationship that caused such damage for me, the source of that aggression and the source of of her pain that she was her her trauma that she was passing on to me came from a deep inferiority complex mm -hmm. um it came from a deep sense of of a deep feeling of shame um real real anger at what she perceived to be the superiority of men and real shame and anger at herself for the unconscious ways in which she continued to hold up her own paternalistic expectations of me. Um, and sort of was, it was her inferiority complexes is what made it such that she could never really liberate herself. Uh, so I, I, I had no, I had no need to subjugate her. I had no need to subjugate anyone. Um, but she sort of kept herself below me uh, in her feelings uh, because she she couldn't escape these formulations of of feeling like I, on some global axis I was better than her, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if I can help anybody shake start to shake that feeling that there isn't a global there isn't it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. then. Maybe that'll help them be free of some of the pain that they carry around and some of the shame they carry around. And maybe that'll help someone else that loves them and that they love be free of that. Maybe so. Maybe so. Can you tell me about some of the promises you had to make to yourself in that time of healing? Oh yeah. Um, hmm. There was a uh, I don't know if I'm ready to talk about this yet. I got extremely close to, I came extremely close to taking my own life. Mm. In winter of 2020. And there was a part of me that really needed to know but I wasn't gonna do it and couldn't believe any promises until I put some systems in place, some emotional bumpers, maybe or trip wires. Um, Let, let some people know that if I'm behaving in these ways, look out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, friend. I appreciate that. Um, and of course, uh, feel free to not talk about whatever you're ready to not talk about. Uh, don't know if that made grammatical sense, but <laughs> I think you understood. Um, I did. As you said that, it reminded me of, um, is it okay to, to speak about that in response? Sure. Um, I wrote about this recently, so I'm working on a book about Meta and it's almost almost done with the first version. And I wrote, I wrote an introduction that um, I think is like very good as an introduction to the book, but I don't, I don't like it uh, personally. <laughs> uh, I'm dissatisfied with it. Um, I think it's it's 
to me, it reads as um, uh, heavy handed, heavy handed. Um, but I think it makes a point well and not, basically I just share some real stuff about my life, different episodes of my life in which I was very unhappy in particular. And um, I wanna make the point of like, hey, I've, I've been unhappy and that's why I care about this because with Meta you can learn to be happier and that's a good thing, you know? And uh, that's why I cared about this in the first place because I was very unhappy. And um, one of the things that I wrote about is uh, a memory of being a teenager and looking in the mirror and just knowing like, at the time, my experience was knowing that the way I was going to die was by suicide. And um, not like I was planning to kill myself then, but just like, oh, life is really hard. And like, I'm going to tap out at some point, basically. And uh, um, um, you know, I think, by and large, I've come to the point where I'm like, I, that it's, it's just hard to see it that way. Like, I don't think that I would end my life. Uh, I don't, you know, I mean, value the first precept, for example, and have structured my life to try to live according to the precepts in which suicide doesn't make very much sense um, for me as, as a Buddhist practitioner in that way. But um, I had a part recently come up that was sort of similar to what you were describing of like, um, something like a fear that that was that memory was actually a promise or something like that and um it feel it feels scary to speak about it even now because i don't want to give that credence or something like that but that like, i'd say like most of my mind is like yeah i would not that doesn't make sense and then part of my mind is like oh like you had that memory when you're a kid and you know uh maybe you would and uh, that's kind of what's coming to mind hearing you talk about that and uh, how different parts of the mind respond to that kind of a desire is, is for me, very internally complex. And it sounds like it was complex for you as well. Yeah. The safety, the safety net idea is helpful. <laughs> that seems good. Uh, I'll be chewing on that, I think. I'm not, uh, no need to actively worry about me, but as I was thinking about that part the other day and it seems good to take care of it with that kind of a safety net that you're talking about. Yeah. It can be hard, I think. I conceive of that. I conceive of the actions I was taking, the spirit in which I was conducting myself as a as a kind of part of me sometimes sometimes i conceive of it as an absence of a part of me mm -hmm. so a place where my ego failed to mediate um the inner critic such mm. that it sort of positive feedback ran out of control mm. you know from you know, no, sort of normal super ego judgment to uh, a fire hose of, of you know, negativity. Uh, I, I don't relate directly to it. Um, I don't try to bring up the part and talk to it. I haven't. Mm -hmm. um, not yet. Yeah. But there's a the the part of me that was worried it might come back isn't. So as to whether, as to what you know, I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not sure it's a part. I think it was an absence. You know, it doesn't feel like something's unintegrated there. But I it felt like I had to work with what was existing in in the ego and strengthen other things that were in the ego to prevent that from coming through, rather than it being some kind of unintegrated shadow, if that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. That makes sense. That, that tracks with my own experience as well of like part, part of the certitude of like, oh yeah, I wouldn't do that is from really developing selfhood in that way. And um, 
if anything, maybe that fear was coming back for me of just, uh, you know, the, the degree of suffering returning and that's uh, like the challenge level <laughs> returning. And that's, uh, for me, it's not so much. Yes, yes. Um, that was what prompted it as a teenager was less like being critical of myself and more just like, if life is, is too hard, then, uh, I mean, in a, in a way, I mean, at the time I was, you know, an atheist and it was like, yeah, you're just, <laughs> then you're out, but I don't, I don't, I don't see it that way anymore. So yeah, uh, don't think you get out that way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that makes me want to ask as well. It felt it felt important to ask this question in this conversation about um, there was something that you said about a year ago that I'll, I'll quote now. You said, I got almost no help from my culture, society, or from the counselor I was seeing who was impatient and supportive when I brought my pain to him for processing. I found few resources online for men who have been abused by women. And the question I just wanted to ask is like, well, what, first of all, just thank you for speaking about this. I think it's um, it's important to speak about, even though it's it's hard and difficult. And I'm grateful that that you do. It feels like a, an act of service, and I appreciate that. And and that's why I wanted to ask. I think um, basically, why do you think that those resources aren't available, and what kinds of resources do you think should exist? What would help someone in that kind of situation? Um, I, I think by and large, I think the reason those resources are not available is that there is a, a deep dependence on paternalism in the American character, both male and female, um, that requires some things of men. Uh, for everyone to feel okay. And men need to have a kind of um, imperviousness to um, emotional ups and downs. They need to have a kind of extra agency to be able to get things done or hold things together in a crisis. Um, they need to be able to do things like serve in the military and fight fires and, and sort of have abilities that people don't want to conceive of, of women as having equal abilities to do, because then we would need to radically restructure things. So there's a kind of myth of hyper agency that persists and this myth um, causes a lot of um, a lot of people to not not in a um, not not in a in a judgmental way but just not even consider the ways in which behaviors that evidently harm women are do the exact same thing to male brains. Um, and so we don't, we don't think of widespread traumatization happening to men as a public health problem the same way we conceive of widespread traumatization of women. Um, and part of that is not just, not just the paternalism, but also sort of a false idea that men and women are, are separate political classes with competing material interests. And the truth, the truth is, that, is that we're the same thing. There's no separation between what's good for women is good for men and what's good for men is good for women. And when men are traumatized and aren't able to get treatment and aren't able to get help and and some portion of them inevitably pass that trauma on to the women if we're only providing resources for women and we're only providing support for women then it's like we've, we're trying to fill up a bucket that's got a hole in the bottom 
Um, there's a lot of complex attitudes. A lot of those, a lot of those attitudes are informed by thousands of years of history and and just the plain the plain facts of of the ways in which we differ and the ways that hormones change our bodies and the, the differentials that arise between us. It, it seems like men are the stronger sex. It seems like men are the weaker sex. Um, and so I think that's why a lot of these resources don't exist. I think there's a there's a need for to, to tell a story that men can't be heard in these ways. Uh, or that if they are hurt in these ways, it's only in war, right? Men get PTSD from war, women get it from assault and abuse, right? It's just not the case. It's just So, um, and, and, and there's some other, some other things that, that this really contributes to. It's very hard to get, um, it's very hard to get good information about how many men are abused because it's so, it's so widely underreported because of what a source of shame it is for men to be experiencing trauma at the hands of someone else. Um, and certainly it's underreported in women too. And I, and I, and I think uh, uh, before this becomes any kind of a, before anyone takes this as any kind of a framing of the battle of the sexes, I, I, um, I, wanted, I want to do the complete opposite of that. Um, and I want, I do not want any of the care or resources that are currently going to support women who have been hurt, who have been abused, to be diverted away and given to men. I want to expand the whole pie. Um, I'm not sure how to do it. There are really enduring, powerful attitudes against men, against cis men, uh, straight men, these sorts of things among the populations that generally provide these support uh, to women. Um, and there's sort of an idea that like they've already got enough. Um, and that may be true in, in some respects. Uh, in other areas, but in this one area, some some shelters are starting to expand a little bit to like include queer men and to include trans men. This is good. This is a good thing. Um, but from my own experience, uh, when I went looking for resources, um, what I was able to find were websites that were that were um, for county women's services, right? Um, that were very explicitly for battered women, very expl explicitly for abused women, which is not what I was looking for. But what I was hoping to find was a, a, a therapist who understood a, a, what abuse does to a man's mind and how to work with it in, a, in that way. Mm -hmm. um, the therapist that I was working with didn't, didn't take it seriously. What I, what I was going through. Um, and uh, yeah, and I mean, some of the people that I told were, were uh, when I was trying to find help, were just kind of mute and, and some of them mocked me. Mm -hmm. um, and all I wanted was, was to be able to think again. I just wanted to be able to, to be able to use my calendar and, and be a dad and, and work again and keep a budget and, and I just couldn't, I, it was damaged, you know. Hmm. Um, well, I didn't need a shelter. I didn't need anything like that. I just needed somebody who understood who could help and I couldn't find it. And maybe um, at the time that I was looking, I, you know, I was sufficiently cognitively impaired that I missed some, that I missed something, but, you know, I've gone in the research I've, I've, I've done to go and, and look, it's just not, there's just not an apparatus out there that's available. And it's, and, and the tragedy of this is that we know uh, that, that domestic abuse happens almost at parity. You know, men are abused almost at the same rate that, that women are, you know. Um, one in four women suffers a sexual assault in her lifetime. One in six men suffer a sexual assault in their lifetime. Hmm. And we know from underreporting that the, the rates we know how much these are underreported, but we, we don't we don't know the full extent of how much they're underreported. Uh, so, so I, I I think there's a real hidden epidemic of of 
traumatized men out there that are unable to connect with someone who just who just says that's real that happened to you here's how you can get back you know um i have no idea how to begin calculating the the cost of human suffering that comes from this uh, and like i said i i don't i don't in any way want to take away from or think that this that this needs to be in any kind of competition with the resources that are available for for women mm -hmm. um i i would like and and i don't think that i don't see the government uh getting involved with this and i don't actually see the current um sort of like network of of shelters and resources for abused women expanding their offerings to do it like for for ideological reasons for the what i've mentioned earlier i think it, it's any of this kind of support is going to have to come from other men hmm. um and that's going to require um confronting their own paternalism and their own expectations of imperviousness and stoicism and sort of all of these things and just recognizing that brains are brains and when they're interacted with in certain ways they break in certain ways and it's just how it is and it's not pretty and it and it brings you face to face with uh the weak parts of yourself and the parts of yourself that you're afraid of and the parts of yourself that you may loathe and feel contempt for because those were the parts that were overwhelmed by someone at some point this is a very difficult thing to work with but men are going to have to do it for one another because i i don't i'm not thus far i think there are such strong egoic barriers to people even recognizing the problem um that uh i don't see a path towards something happening at scale mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that makes sense that makes sense uh it seems like part of what you're wanting to be available that would have been good to be available for you and would be good for other people going through similar situations is like just being acknowledged that this can happen to men and that it's in the same way that it's not good when women are abused and that they deserve love and care and compassion it's like it's not good if a man is abused a man is abused either and like the the same sort of depth of human response that's available when you correctly recognize that that's not acceptable for a woman to be abused just the same feeling just the know. same feeling yeah yes yeah but it but it just interacts with so many of our of our unexamined feelings about men and our unexamined mm -hmm. biases about what men are supposed to be and, and what a successful man is versus an unsuccessful man or a winner or a loser or an alpha or a beta or whatever um and it just and and all, you know yeah that's it's it, it interacts with so much unprocessed shit that mm -hmm. it's really hard uh to get someone to respond in a way that's um, even interested in helping, mm -hmm. you know, when a lot of times all the guy, all the guy needs, right, is somebody to be like, if he needs exposure therapy, or he needs talk therapy, or he needs, you know, whatever it is, you know, he might just recover on his own if he gets hooked back into doing the thing that he loves and can rebuild his his sense of self, you know, um, but we, you know, sometimes a lot of times these cases are going to be really complex and they are going to require a professional that understands the many ways that um, that cultural constructions of masculinity intersect with abuse and intersect with with a, a damaged self concept. He's good. They're going to need real dedicated psychological work. And and that's just not therapists just don't know how to do that. They don't even think about it in, mm. in, in as being like a, a problem they need to research and train for it so hmm. i didn't say all therapists i should say many therapists do not have this skill you know? uh -huh. i'm sure, sure sure some of them do yeah sure sure yeah i feel grateful that we can talk about this in a conversation because i think when you put ideas like this into text on the internet in a certain <laughs> medium uh, uh it's it's incredibly easy for people to misunderstand intent yeah. or what's being said and i think with words and length and voice it's like what you're saying is just eminently reasonable you know so um, I, I hope so yeah 
at least to me it sounds eminently I, I i don't know and i'm uh and at the, at the very i mean um you know i'm just appreciating as well like in the medium of a conversation it's like it's it's impossible to deny that someone is a person who had an experience you know so even if everything you just said was utter nonsense and a terrible idea, which is not at all the case. <laughs> but even if it was, it's like you are a person that had an experience and you deserve to be seen in that and loved in that. Even if you're making a terrible policy proposal, which you're not, is very reasonable. <laughs> it seems evidently reasonable to me, but like you cannot deny someone's humanity in a conversation and in the way that you can in a textual medium all of the time, you know? Yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no place to open up the psychological distance. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. and it, it, it seems like that's part of what you're sort of asking for. It's just like, hey, to be for men in this situation to be seen as a human that went through that's something. It. You know, it's like yeah. yes, Not, specific things yeah. would be helpful as well, but just like to be acknowledged and seen in that. And who doesn't want that? Ultimately, is who who doesn't have that? desire you know I, right. so, so many of of the demands that people are making rightfully so are are saying please set aside the concept you have of what i am and see me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and that's i think that's what i'm saying too is hey though like the way the way you think of me and people like me is getting in the way and can you set it aside for a second and listen because i'm not asking for a lot mm -hmm. you know I, I, I feel lucky I was able to do it myself in a way. I'm not sure everybody, um, in fact, I feel sure that many men don't, mm -hmm. they don't recover and they just yeah. stay, they just stay psychologically hobbled the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm grateful that you were able to, do the healing that you needed as well. And I pray that this conversation will lead to other men in that situation getting the help that they need. Uh, and I appreciate you talking about it. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for making the space for it. I really appreciate it. Yes. I'm remembering as well that you said earlier in the conversation that part of the reason you joined the Marines was a sense of wanting to learn how to be a man. And I wonder, um, what you presently would tell your past self about what being a man means to you now. Mm. That it's a, it's something you use. to get what you need. It's not something you have to be. It exists between you and the world. It's always a story that someone outside of you, someone inside of you. It's always very close to the heart of the story that you tell about yourself, but it's always in the story that you tell about yourself. You can't um approach it directly you can you can see it in the in it's a, it only expresses through the other things that you do and so any image you've got of it or any icon you've got of it or, or anything it's gonna it's not only gonna fall short it's gonna lead you astray um a lot of times especially for young and, and underdeveloped guys like myself under under spiritually developed um, the image of masculinity or the image of what it means to be a man substitutes for um, the insecurities one has about of their abilities and their virtues. And I think what you come to understand over time as you, as you develop as a human being is, is you, you eventually um, grow out of being someone who, who is a man and you grow into someone who can use manliness as needed and can set it aside when it's not necessary. Um, 
you're not subject to it anymore. It's it's yours to do with as you please. And I would say that that to me would be uh, that's, that's the manliest thing I can I can think of being totally in control. You're the one that gets to gets to run it. Mm. Um, and I and I uh, I mean I mean you know it's not it's not exclusive exclusive of women to say that that's the end state of uh, femininity as well as understanding that it's a cultural. Um, to some extent, it's a cultural technology, probably something, you know, gender is something akin to, to spirituality um, in the sense that it's this extraordinary phenomenon that's in all of us um, and is so deep in our identities. But um, you, you can get to a point where you can self-transform uh, as needed. You can, you can use spirituality you can use gender you can use religion to create uh better circumstances for yourself the people that you love uh, you can be skillful with them and i would say that that's that's what i would try to go back and tell old me is don't worry about what it looks like just get strong hmm. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I think, um, how to put this? It feels precious to hear that because um, just knowing from the story you've shared about what you've been through and what, what, what you had to endure and uh, problem solve through in your life to be able to speak to that and uh, feels it feels precious to hear it so thank you for sharing yeah thanks for saying so i'm wondering as well about uh you know we're sort of touching on this a little bit with the issue about what resources would be useful for men who've been abused and uh this is something i uh well to put it this way i i at a certain point I was actually extremely political for a while. And then I sort of set that aside and have gone in the opposite direction for many years. And then uh, you don't seem to stray away from discussing things that are political and seem to share various perspectives at uh, different times. And I, I appreciate that there's a lot of nuance in what you share, which is one of the things that was lacking in my own uh, political interests for a time. It was very easy to think in black and white terms and this good, that bad. and uh, you don't seem to be immune to that particular uh, problem. Uh, you don't seem to be having that particular problem. And, uh, but because it's nuanced, it's uh, dense and complex. And so I wonder if you could speak to your political views and what you see and what you would like to see in the world. Sure. Um... Um, this is, this is the part of, this is one of the parts in my life where I struggle the most with integrity. Hmm. Hmm. I have so many different parts of myself in so many different places hmm. at, at war with each other. <laughs> There's so much confusion. Um, I, I think about the way people generally, you know, you get on a podcast to talk about politics and you're gonna present them as like, here I'm standing on a hill and I'm shining a light so brightly that no man could falter. <laughs> Just come with me and we'll save the world, right? Um, and my feelings, my feelings about, are about politics right now are, are that I, I, I don't know, I don't know anything. I don't know, nobody seems to know. And I feel like if we, if somebody had the right answer, we'd have heard it and we'd be doing it. Um, and I'm not, I'm not totally, I grew up in a really, um, in a very right-wing family. Like Orange County is ground zero for Reaganite conservatism. Uh, and my dad was, 
see, I was afraid of this. We'd start talking about politics. And oh. Everybody start going to sleep. No, I just either. No. Uh, so, so I grew up very, very right wing and, and in not just in my rebellion, but also growing up with the Catholic values that I had, I didn't, I didn't see a, a focus on the poor in the right wing and, and sort of the fact of that and, and my own queerness and the rhetoric of inter-individuality and acceptance and, and being your authentic self that, that is, that you hear on the left really drew me to the left. And I, um, and I identified there and worked there and agitated there and fundraised there for many years. Um, even while I was in the military, I was dropping pizzas off at Occupy Wall Street and like trying to help. Um, it's always been important to me. Um, uh, and, and, I, and the last five years have been a, a really deeply disillusioning time um, because I, I feel like things have really transformed from one uh, in which I, I believed that, that uh, if the left won, that they're really, that we really would move towards greater justice for people and that we really would move towards greater material justice for the poor and that we would move toward um, more acceptance for people as they are. And I feel like I've, what I've watched um, is, is, is that the people on the left are sort of enslaved to the same false dichotomies that the people on the right are, but just from the other side. Um, and I think there's sort of just as much hate and ignorance and nastiness. Um, and I don't, and I've just come uh, to feel like in a lot of ways I was lied to um, by people on the left who um, made me feel as though they, they cared about building a world that would be less alienating uh, and less... Um, I, I, alienating is really what it is. Alienating from the self. Um, I, I, I don't trust. I don't. I have zero trust in anyone to wield power wisely anymore. I'm not sure who's got the capability to do it. So I feel pretty politically homeless. And maybe I mean the way I found Teapot and and all of you was sort of via dissident left accounts. Where, the, where I felt like I was looking around at what we were doing and, and realizing it obviously wasn't working, but nobody was going into the wilderness to search their souls and figure out how it would work. We just kept doubling down on the same things that weren't working. Um, and so I, so I feel pretty politically homeless right now because I think that's my stance is nobody fucking knows, it's obvious. Uh, and if anything, the stuff we're doing is making it worse. And so I, I, I think that I think we we have a real meta crisis that we're facing. The, you know, the empire is declining, and, and climate change is happening. And it doesn't look like we're going to be able to respond to it in a skillful way. Um, I, 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 you know, I, everyone's kind of got this sense of dread of what might be coming up in the next few years. And the only thing I can think to tell people is like, just get ready as best as you can, just whatever you can. Like, um, I guess I, you know, it, it's kind of a position of left localism in a sense that like strengthen yourself, strengthen your community, do whatever you can to like learn skills you're going to need. If there's a sudden drop off in quality of life or there's a sudden drop off in, in, uh, services that are available or you know if the government gets unstable in in some places i don't know that any of these things are going to happen but i i feel like preparing for them and uh, uh can can only help you can only help people uh, physically economically spiritually so um so to me that seems to hit the sweet spot but Here's, you know, and, and here's where, here's this big struggle with integrity that I've got here is like, I order all my groceries from Amazon, you know, um, 
Like I, I have a garden. I'm learning how to grow food. It's only my second year. Like I can't, you know what I mean? Like, um, I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning how to repair my own things. I'm learning how to build my own structures. I'm learning how to do these things, but it's slow. You know, I'm a, I'm a middle-class American and I was, and I was raised in this system to specialize in, in something. And I, and I did that, you know, and I'm coming to this late in life and, um, and realizing how out of touch I, I am with the, with, the, um, with ways of living that, that aren't spiritually deleterious. Um, just what a, what a creature of modernity I've been, I, I guess that's what I, I'm trying to move more toward, uh, a synthesis uh, and, and to get ready. Cause I, I, I do, I do sincerely. Uh, I think, I think um, things have already gotten really bad for the lower 20% of society and we just don't see them. But if you're in any major American city, there's tent cities everywhere. There's, there's tent towns everywhere. Um, things are bad. They're getting bad. And I think they're going to get worse. And uh, my politics are, uh, meet your neighbors, um, learn skills, get strong. That, that's a pretty good hill, even if it doesn't uh, have answers to all the problems. That's a, that's yeah. a good hill. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's honest, you know, it's honest, which is uh, lacking elsewhere. So I appreciate you being honest. I'm trying. Yeah. Um, well, um, something else I wanted to make sure to ask you about is I know that you've recently started a coaching practice and I would love to hear more about that and what, what you do in your coaching practice and uh, what kind of person is a, is a good client for, that might want to work with you or anything you'd like to share about that. Oh, thanks for asking. Um, um, starting to do this has felt really wonderful because it, it, it feels like it feels like the natural extension of a process that started during the pandemic and after uh, after the wound that I received from that relationship really, I really had, that crisis was an opportunity to, to rebuild my life around spiritual practice um, and not just have it be sort of an accessory to whatever else I was doing, uh, but to have the rest of my life supporting the practice. And this feels like a really lovely extension to be able to also start to bring my profession into practice with that. Um, now I'm not, I have not gone full-time with it yet. I'm still also I'm still a general contractor on the side. Um, but what I've been doing so far is, is, um, is meeting with clients and getting to know them and, uh, helping them to see a sort of broad overview of their life, uh, as the kind of domains of their life and then where they would like their lives to be. And then we look at the differential and why their mm -hmm. lives aren't what they want to be. And oftentimes uh, there's something multifaceted going on. And it's a lot of times there's cognitive behavioral things happening. And I'm not, I'm not a therapist and I don't do therapy, but I understand uh, cognitive behavioral theory very well. And, and so I could sometimes help with insights or see connections between emotions and behaviors and so forth that are not apparent to people. And then the other part of it is, um, is working with meditation, particularly non-dual meditation um, and having them focus on nothing and all of the strange, mysterious things that happen when you do that. And then checking in with the self and with the maps of the cognitive behavioral complexes that that um that drive us in a lot of ways and that sometimes limit us and and that provide structure for our lives and you can see 
the reflection sort of of the non-dual work in the changes to the cognitive behavioral structure of life. And so sort of by, by um, creating a fruitful dialectic between these, you know, sort of like concentrated irrationality and concentrated rationality, um, then we can really start to reveal what the mechanics of the gap in between what the mechanics of the self look like and and what's holding what's holding that back where the where the injuries are where the where the limiting behaviors are where the limiting beliefs are um and we and we can start to work with those by by pursuing um improvement of one's immediate circumstances and immediate life hmm. Hmm. is there uh a certain kind of person that seems to be a good fit for working with you? They're very diverse hmm. so far. I couldn't say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, not yet. Not yet, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, good. I wouldn't be surprised if someone was hearing this and felt felt called to work with you. So I hope that happens. I think there's a lot of a lot of skills that you have to offer folks. So yeah, I'm glad that you're doing that work. Thanks, um, Tosh. Is there uh, anything else that you'd like to talk about or dive more deeply into? Um, since I've got your platform and your audience mm -hmm. watching this, I might say, if you go to my Twitter profile, which is at vivid void with a little underscore, there, um, there's a link to my discord mm -hmm. and we're doing a weekly meditation there, which is just, it's just basically sit and Zen. There's nothing to it. Um, and that starts at 8 a.m every friday morning pacific, pacific. time yeah, yeah. 7 30 um i do instructions just real basic stuff to get people started um and we've got that going and, and some other fun things or uh, some other kind of great things going on there too we we set intentions for the day like a lot of us set intentions for the day and share music and poetry and there's an iliad reading club going on in there right now which is super cool um mm. it's, a, it's a neat little spot for for um like-minded folks people were so I, if if I, I would i i couldn't say the link because it's a bunch of gibberish <laughs> but it's there in my profile if yeah. anyone wants to come hang out we're glad to have you yes great i'm glad you're mentioning that and uh i'll put a link to that in the i like to reference tweets in the thread that i put us out for these so i'll put that in the thread for sure yeah thank you yeah well thank you so much for speaking with me it's been a real pleasure and uh yeah, I learned a lot from hearing you talk about the different things that we discussed. So thank you for sharing yourself so fully. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on. Mm -hmm.